Turn over to the book of Colossians. I want to share a series with you this weekend from Colossians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And I tell you, Colossians is a powerful, powerful book. I don't know that I've ever really taught from a whole series from Colossians, but I'm going to do it this weekend. I was studying this just uh, this last week, and, and there were some major things that spoke to me through this book. One of them, let me just give a little bit of an introduction to this, that the people in Colossae, uh, Paul had never met them personally. Now, you can see that in a number of verses, but here in Colossians chapter 1, verse 3, the Apostle Paul said, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and love which you have to all of the saints. In other words, these weren't people that he ministered to directly, but he had heard about their acceptance of the Lord. In chapter 2, verse 1, he says, For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. So this makes it very clear that the Apostle Paul had never met these people. These weren't people that he ministered to, but most people suspect based on uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 7, it says, As ye also learned of Epirus, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. And then also in Colossians chapter 4, verse 12 over here, it mentions uh, Epirus and it says, Who is one of you a servant of Christ? So most people believe that what happened, Colossae was uh, not too far from Ephesus. And Paul spent three and a half years in Ephesus. And it says, so that from Ephesus, uh, Ephesus was sounded out the gospel throughout all of Asia. And so most people believe that Epirus was a person who got born again through Paul's ministry. And then he was from Colossae is what it says over there in chapter 4, verse 12. And he took the gospel back. And so these, in a sense, were the grandkids of the Apostle Paul. They weren't his direct disciples, but they were disciples of one of his disciples. And so in chapter 2, I want to just focus on these verses for a few moments. Paul is writing unto them, and he, he said here in chapter 2, verse 1, I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them in Laodicea, and, as, and, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Paul was really concerned about these people because he didn't minister to them directly. And I don't think that this is a criticism of Epirus at all, but it's just, you know, it's like, uh, have you ever played one of those games? I forgot what they call it, gossip or something like that, where you tell the person next to you something and you have them pass it down the row. And I can guarantee you, if you've got 12 people involved, it's not going to be the same message by the time it gets to the end of that row. Somebody will leave out a word, insert a word, Things just change. Every generation that you get away from the person who received that revelation, there is an opportunity for something to be left out, something to be added in, and something to be not right. And this is what the Apostle Paul was talking about. And you know, as he was sharing these things, as I was reading this, this is really what my heart is and what I believe that God has spoken to me, that I believe that today the gospel has been changed from what it was originally delivered. Over in the book of um, uh, Jude, I believe it is, it says we have to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. And you know, this was only written like 20 years or 30 years, something like that, after the resurrection of Jesus. So in a very short period of time, the gospel had already started to be changed. People had come in and started adding things to it, some of the notable ones that are obvious in Scripture, like in the book of Galatians and other places, there were people called Judaizers who came in and said, Oh, yeah, you've got to believe on Jesus as being the Messiah, but you've also got to be a Jew. And you've got to keep all the feast days. The males have to be circumcised. You have to do all of these rituals. And they tried to add to the gospel. And that's the reason that the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Galatians and he came out real strong and he says, if anybody, even an angel preaches unto you another gospel than what you've preached, let him be accursed. 
such a strong statement that I'm sure it just shocked people and they thought he couldn't have meant what he said. So in the next verse, he says, again, I say unto you, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. And so they were having to fight and contend for the gospel within just a few years after it, it, it began to spread. And I think that here we are 2000 years later and brothers and sisters, what most people know of the gospel today is not the same as what the apostle Paul shared. It's not what the word of God teaches. We have so many traditions and doctrines of men that make the word of God of no effect. Mark chapter seven, verse 13, Jesus said that he says, your traditions and doctrines of man make the word of God of none effect. And I tell you, we, the church is just rampant with this today. And so as I was reading this, the apostle Paul, I felt his conflict and his desire that he had for people to know the pure gospel, the true gospel, and without all of these other things added to it. And that's the reason that he wrote this book, is to clarify some things and make sure that people had the basics down. And so this is what I want to do this weekend, is just to take the things he wrote right here in this book of Colossians to these people, he was wanting to make sure that they had the right message, that they hadn't perverted it and hadn't moved away from it. And as I was studying this, I tell you, there's so many things in the book of Colossians that are contrary to the way we think today. Hence, that's the reason we don't get the same results that these people got. If you want to experience God, you are going to have to change your thinking. The Bible says in many places, one of them is Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The way we experience God is how we think. Now, that's a that's a radical thought to some people because they just they pray, they pray call out to God out of desperation. They think that if they are desperate enough, if their, if their situation is pitiful enough, that that will move God. But it's not true. You are going to experience God the way that you renew your mind and the way you think about him. When I was told that God didn't heal, I never got healed because that was contrary to my thinking. When I was told that God's the one to kill people and put problems on people, I saw people around me die who embraced problems and stuff. You will experience God the way you think. That's not to say that God is the way you think, but you, God is limited to what he can do in your life according to the way you think. Proverbs 23, 7, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. If you think wrong, you're going to get wrong results. Second Peter chapter one, verses, uh, verse, well, verse three says, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us to glory and virtue. Everything that you need is going to come through the knowledge of that you have, or the knowledge that you don't have will limit what God can do in your life. Boy, those are important statements. And there's a lot of people that don't understand this. They just think that if, if God's really a God, why doesn't he move? He moves in your life according to the way you think and believe. Everything that you need comes through the knowledge that you have. I talked to a woman down here tonight and she was just real sincere saying that she had some problems. She wasn't going to tell me what they were. She didn't want to confess something negative, I guess. So anyway, I prayed with her and basically just spoke to her. I said, you know, you can't give away what you don't have. And if you don't really understand God's love for you, then you can't turn around and give it to other people. If you haven't renewed your mind and understood how much he loves you, it's going to limit you loving other people. And it doesn't matter how much you pray for it. You can pray and say, oh, God, make me a loving person. But if you don't understand the new covenant, if you are still trying to relate to God by the old covenant under a performance-based mentality, and if you think relationship is all about performance, then you are going to wind up treating other people the way you think. You are going to have to have your mind renewed to understand God's unconditional love for you. And until you receive it for yourself, you can't give it to other people. 
Boy, those are big, big statements. So here's the apostle Paul saying, man, I have great conflict for you because you haven't seen me. I didn't minister to you personally. And so I'm going to say some things just to make sure you got the basics. And look at what he says right here in verse two. This is Colossians 2, 2, that their hearts might be comforted being knit together in love unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. Now I'm going to come back to this second verse, but let's just read a few verses here in context. In verse 3, talking about in Jesus, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. The Apostle Paul here is recognizing that how does Satan come against us? You know, again, there's so many things right here. I could, uh, I've meditated on this stuff a lot. And it's hard to put it all out in a proper order. I don't know how I'm going to do this. But um, most people believe that Satan just attacks them, overpowers them, that they don't have any control over it. I have people come to me and tell me how sick they are, how poor they are, how messed up their life is. And they act like I don't have any control. I don't have any responsibility in this area whatsoever that, you know, they, the devil just picked on them. But I'm telling you, Satan can't do anything to you without your consent and cooperation. The way he comes against you is through thoughts. The way he came against Adam and Eve was through thoughts. He didn't take some elephant, some mammoth, and put their, his, you know, their foot on Eve's head and say, eat of the fruit or I'll squish it. He didn't come with a tiger or a lion. He took an animal that the scripture says was the most subtle of all of the beasts. And the way that he came against them is, has God really said and begin to question the word of God? You cannot do anything without, first of all, going there in your mind. Thank you for that thunderous silence. (laughs) And again... See, I'm countering a lot of what we think today. People, I don't have anything to do with this. You know, I think one of the reasons that it took 960 years for Adam to die was because he didn't know how to die. (laughs) He didn't think death. They didn't give balloons when he turned 30, black balloons saying you're over the hill and you're about to die. He didn't know that there was a flu season every year. He didn't know that when you were so old, you're supposed to start getting older and decrepit. And he didn't know how to die. I know some of you think, oh man, you're kind of a little out there on this. I really believe that one of the reasons there is so much sickness is because sickness is talked about, promoted so much. If you watch any television at all, and I try not to watch a lot of it, but just the little bit I watch, I mean, it's not unusual to hear 15, 20 ads in one program about sickness and about this and all of this stuff. And they just plant seeds in you about sickness all of the time. And you're supposed to expect this. They, these ads will say, check with your doctor. And I think, check with my doctor. I don't have a doctor. Who in the world has a doctor? Probably a lot of people sitting right in here. What in the world do you need a doctor for? Anyway. Well, some people are so concerned about health care. We've got to have all this health care. You ought to leave health care for people that don't know Jesus. Amen. I'm not against doctors. I'm just saying they're overworked as it is. Let the unbelievers go to them. Amen. You should be walking in the supernatural health of God. And some of you think, well, man, you're weird. That's the reason that you're sick because you think that sickness is just normal and that you're supposed to have all of these problems. God did not create us to be as frail as what we see people today. You have to be taught to be sick. I know many of you think that's not true, but it is. It is. 
It says, beware lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. You know the word enticing words right here. Paul said, keep your finger here in Colossians, but look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the apostle Paul was talking about how he came and ministered to these people in Corinth. And he said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And in verse 4. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. But in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Notice he said my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words. Put that together with Colossians chapter 2 verse 4. And this I say lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. What does enticing words mean? I could spend a lot of time on this, but basically the word enticing here is made up of a compound word. One of them is logos, which is word, and the other one is talking about persuasive words. And I looked it up in Vines Dictionary, and Vines, W.E. Vines, said that this word is specifically talking about just persuasion as contrasted to demonstration. And if you put this together with what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, My preaching wasn't with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. And he he started making a point out of this. He was talking to people who were criticizing him and his authority. And over in chapter 4, I believe it's verse 20, 1 Corinthians 4.20, he says something. When I come, I'm not going to know the speech of those who are puffed up. That's an old English way for saying operating in pride. But I'm going to know the power because the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power and demonstration of the spirit. Basically what he was saying was those who want to counter me and sit there and disagree with my doctrine, they're using all of these arguments and persuasive words, but they don't have any demonstration. They don't have any power operating in their life. So he basically says, when I come... If a person doesn't have any power in their life, you can't talk. Only those who can demonstrate and back up what they're saying with the power of God have a right to speak. Man, that's strong. You know, if we were to use that today, there's not very many ministers that'd be able to speak. There's lots of people that can talk and they have education and they can put sentences together and they're dramatic in the way they present, but show me some power. The Bible says that the Lord confirmed the word with signs and wonders following. If you don't have the power of God operating in your life, then it's because you aren't speaking the word. You might speak enticing words of man's wisdom. You might be, uh, you know, seminary educated. I mean, seminary educated. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that you're right. Who's got the power of God operating in their life? And man, today in our church, we have, I'm talking about the church as in general, there's some great churches. You know, we've got some pastors here that I know. I'm sure there's great churches here in this area. But I'm saying that as a whole, the church has gotten to where they have all kinds of doctrines, but they can't demonstrate the power of God. Jesus, when he was challenged on his authority, he says, if you don't believe me because of what I say, then believe the works that I do. The works that I do testify of who I am. Over in Hebrews chapter 2, it says that Jesus was a man approved by God through signs and wonders and mighty miracles that he did. If Jesus had to be approved, if Jesus had to have a stamp of approval on him, then who in the world do we think we are that our words are more persuasive than Jesus, that we can somehow or another make an impact without demonstrating the power of God? We need to be demonstrated. We got big churches right here in this city, I'm sure, that have tens of thousands of people coming. But there's people that they don't see any healing. They don't see the power of God manifest. Lives aren't changed. They're just preaching. They have these programs that attract people and they have all of these things. But where are the results? And this is what Paul is talking about. He says, the reason I'm writing unto you is so that nobody will beguile you with enticing words, just persuasive speech. But he goes on and talks about how that there has to be the evidence of it. Where are the changed lives? Where is the power of God in people's lives? 
And I'm telling you, most of, of Christianity today is powerless. It doesn't change a person's life. It won't get you prosperous. It won't set you free. Most Christians are on just as much medication, go to the same psych, the same, the same shrink that all the unbelievers go to. When problems happen, Christians are just as afraid as the unbelievers. It's not supposed to be this way. There's not a tremendous amount of demonstration. And you know why? Because we've moved away from these very basic things that Paul is talking about right here. And so we need to uh, analyze some things. We need to do an inventory here and find out what it was that Paul was trying to get across to these people because he was afraid that they would be beguiled, deceived by these enticing words. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, this is where the body of Christ as a whole sits today. Now, again, praise God. I think that there's a tremendous move of God. People are receiving the truth. I had probably a dozen people tonight tell me about that their life has just been radically changed. I had one man tell me about he's been a Christian for over 30 years, but it's only been in the last year or two that the Word of God has come alive. And now he goes back to his church and tells them what the Word says, and he's being criticized for it and persecuted. I tell you, if you want to get in trouble in church, start standing up for the Word of God, and they'll kick you out. So let's go back to verse 2 and look at some of these things. He says in verse 2, he says... He's praying that their hearts might be comforted. So let me ask you this. The things that he's going to list and talk about right here, the end result of it is that your heart is comforted. So let me just, I'm not asking you to raise your hand on this, but I want you in your own heart just to say, are you, is your heart comforted? You know, when you look at things that are going on in this world, and you hear about all of the terrible things. They were talking today about, I think, 500-something people killed in, in Cairo yesterday and all of the problems in the world that are going on. Man, are you upset? Are you disturbed? Are you comforted? And you know what? There's a lot of Christians that think, well, you should be disturbed. No, you shouldn't. The Bible says in Isaiah 26, 3, the Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him and it didn't put any qualifications on it except during a time of recession, except when there's an epidemic, except when there is turmoil and maybe fighting going on and things like this. You know, the apostle Paul who wrote all of these things, like in Philippians, he wrote rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. He wrote that from prison. He was facing possible ex ex execution, and yet he says, rejoice in the Lord always. There isn't any reason for us not to be comforted. Now, I'm not saying that everything is good, and I'm not saying you just stick your head in the sand and ignore that people have problems. That's not what I'm talking about. But it doesn't matter what the world does. Our relationship with God is secure. Everything that is physical is just temporary. We need to look on the things that can't be seen. We need to look at the eternal things and recognize that if, you know, uh, David said it this way, he says, though the mountains be removed and cast into the sea, yet will I rejoice in the Lord. Well, that hadn't happened yet. And until the mountains are removed and cast into the sea, you ought to still be rejoicing in the Lord. There isn't any excuse. Now there are reasons why we get disturbed and not comforted. It's because we don't know these things. But if we were really focused on the things that the apostle Paul is talking about right here, did you know what? You should be comforted even in the midst of problems, even in the midst of all kinds of things going on. If the doctor tells you you're going to die, you still ought to be comforted. You shouldn't lose your peace. Thank you. That one amen and a couple of heads. Most people, well, that's not so. That's terrible. Well, we sing these songs when we all get to heaven. What a day that'll be. And then the doctor tells you you're going there and you cry. What's wrong with this? I'm, say, I'm not saying that we should just accept sickness and stuff, but I am saying that you should be comforted if you understand these things. He says, I'm going to say these things that your hearts might be comforted. You can be in absolute peace regardless of what's going on in your life. You know, I just had some people come and interview me last Friday 
for a book that they're writing about Vietnam. And it turns out it's the unit that I was in in Vietnam. And this, anyway, it was really a neat experience because this guy was showing me his book. He had 470 pictures and and I was thumbing through it. And I, and I said, I know that guy, I've seen him. And he came over and looked at it and he says, that's me. <laughs> but it was 43 years later. And back, you know, when he was a kid, he had hair. Now he was absolutely bald and had a beard down to his waist and I just didn't direct. And anyway, it was really amazing to see a guy that I hadn't seen. And uh, I actually started showing them my pictures of Vietnam and I had a picture of this guy sitting on my cot in my bunker. And I'd always wondered what his name was and he was sitting across the table. So anyway, but they were asking me about how did Vietnam affect you? And I said, look, I'm not a very good example of all of this. They've done 600 interviews, 600 interviews. And uh, they were asking me about how did it affect you and how did you feel? And I said, guys, I was just so in love with the Lord. My mind was so stayed on God. All I did was study the word 12 to 15 hours a day. I said, I'm not a real good example. And they started asking me questions and I told them about times that, man, we were all about to die. Within hours, the place where I was was overrun and nearly every person killed. The chaplain and I got out just right before it happened. And I said, man, all I was thinking about is, oh, Jesus, I could see you today. I could be with you before the sun sets. And then I was praying for the Vietnamese that I had my gun pointed at. Because I knew if I died, I knew where I'd go, but I wasn't sure about them. And I felt love and compassion going out of me for the people I was shooting at. And they were just shocked and they were looking at me and I said, honestly, I, and they said, do you remember that? I said, I don't remember anything, but Jesus, I was just focused on the Lord. Anyway, the reason I tell you that story is to say that I was in the midst of a war zone. I went through terrible things, not only the war, but all of the sin and the temptation and all of the things that were going on. And it was just like I was in a bubble. I was oblivious to it. My heart was comforted. And I went through things. I went through things that in the natural I should have been. I should have had all kinds of problems. But I've never had any uh, trauma, PTSD. I didn't have any of this stuff because I was just enveloped in God. This is what Paul is talking about. If you understand the things he's talking about, your heart should be comforted. And there are some of you that in your mind are sitting there disqualifying yourself and saying, but you don't know my situation. Well, I'm saying you don't know what Paul's talking about because you can be so far into God that nothing can reach you. You can be so enveloped in God that you're comforted. And I don't care if you're facing death, if you're facing divorce, if you're facing financial failure, if you're facing whatever, if the world is going one way, the apostle Paul lived in a situation much worse than what you and I live in. He lived in a situation where Caesar proclaimed himself as God, where slavery was the rule of the day, where people were taken and beaten and terrible things going on. And yet Paul prospered and turned the world right side up. As bad as things are, it could be worse. We ought to be praising God. Things are as good as they are and we can be comforted regardless of what's happening. And I know there are some of you thinking, oh man, you're just way out there. Well, don't wake me up because this is how I'm living my life. Amen. (laughs) So he says, I pray that your hearts would be comforted, being knit together in love. That's the, man, I can preach on every one of these phrases. I'm not going to do it. But this is the only way we will ever come together is in love. It's not going to be through all of these other things. We aren't all going to be the same. God doesn't want us to be all the same. But we can get to where we walk in love with each other. That's the only way that we'll ever be knit together in love. And it says, unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. This mystery is spoken about four times. Here in Colossians. And it's explained in Colossians chapter 1. Look at this. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 26. It says, Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but is now made manifest to his saints. The word manifest means to make evident to your physical senses. 
In other words, this is not supposed to be a mystery anymore. This is something that is now revealed in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, nobody understood this. It was a mystery. It was hidden. But now it should be obvious. And the sad fact is this still is not obvious to the average Christian. And in verse 27, it says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is... Christ in you, the hope of glory. So what he's talking about here, the thing he's trying to do so that nobody can beguile us with enticing words and move us away from these foundational things, he's praying that we would get the acknowledgement of the mystery, which is Christ in us, the hope of glory. But he didn't want us just to acknowledge it. He wanted us to get the understanding And then the riches of the full understanding and acknowledgement of the mystery. You know, there's five different levels here that he's talking about. And it's one thing to say that you believe that Christ lives on the inside of you. But did you know on a practical basis, most people don't believe this? That usually goes over about like that. (laughs) Some people, oh, I believe it. But notice that it says you've got to have the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of Christ, which is God, Christ in you, the hope of glory. I tell you, if we could get this knowledge that Christ himself lives on the inside of us, that you are God possessed, not just when You know, the anointing comes on you and you feel a goose bump up and down your spine. But at your very worst moment, you are God-possessed. Christ lives on the inside of you. If you could live with the riches of the full assurance to the understanding and the acknowledgement of this mystery, then I can guarantee you it would keep you from being deceived. It would keep you from being led astray. It would keep you from having all of these problems that so many of us deal with. And again, I'm not the greatest example. I'm not a perfect example. But I have lived this to a degree that even going through war, I was just so focused on God. And if they were going to kill me, wonderful. Man, I get to go be with Jesus. I went through hardship and being separated from everything I loved and wanted for 13 months in Vietnam. And I just had an awesome time in the presence of God. I have lived it enough to know that this is absolutely true. That when you are focused on Christ in you, it just makes you um, immune to all of the stuff that the devil's got. You can be so focused on God Almighty living on the inside of you that it just inoculates you against all of the junk of this world. Man, that's an awesome statement. And I believe that there's very few believers that have the riches of the full assurance and understanding and acknowledging this mystery which is Christ in us. Jesus will never leave us nor forsake us. You know, there's times that you don't feel that way. But your feelings are wrong. This is what the scripture says, is that Christ is in you. If you have been born again, then Jesus said in John chapter 14, there's so many places I hadn't got time to turn to them all. But he says, if man loves me, I will come unto him and make my abode with him. In Hebrews chapter 13, he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. There's times that you don't feel the presence of God, but that has nothing to do with nothing. You can't feel all of these things. You know, here's another experience that I had in Vietnam, and that is that I didn't understand all of these things. Now, I was wrapped in the presence of God, but I was just wanting uh, this emotional thing. I'd had this tremendous experience where I was caught up in the presence of God and I was wanting this feeling of his presence. And I was just begging and pleading with God. And um, I don't know about the theology of all this. I'm just telling you, this is what happened to me. So you can figure it out on your own. But I was begging and pleading for God to just reveal himself and for me to feel his presence. And anyway, one morning I woke up and it was like God had died 
And there was no God in this world. I don't have the words to describe this to you. But I really believe that this is what hell is going to be like. I believe hell is going to have physical flames because there's scriptures that talk about it. But I think that the worst part of hell is that there won't be any God. There will be no presence of God. There will be no, nothing good. Everything will be evil and no hope. And for three days, I felt that. Now, I believe based on scripture that the Lord didn't leave me. But all of my sense of or awareness of his presence left. And for three days, I mean, it just devastated me. I was a chaplain's assistant and people would come into the chaplain's bunker to make an appointment with him. And I was, I was so messed up that I just was sure everybody could see how I felt. And I remember literally getting in this little, we had a little closet I had made and I got under some clothes and piled them over me and hid so that nobody could see me. I couldn't face anybody. I was devastated. For three days, I fasted and prayed and begged God, God, what happened? Where did you go? Oh God. And and I knew the scripture that says he'd never leave me nor forsake me, but man, I felt like he had. And at the end of three days, I woke up early in the morning beside my cot, kneeling beside my cot, and I was praying. And I woke up that way, and nothing special happened. I didn't have a bolt of lightning or a goose bump, but all of a sudden, I just had my normal peace back. And the Lord spoke to me, and he says, that's what it feels like if I wasn't with you. And he says, on your worst day. He says, I'm always with you. And man, after that, you know what? Since then, I've never begged God to, oh God, please be with me. Because man, I found out what it was like to be without God. Anyway, the reason I bring all this up is to say some of you may feel like God's not around, but God's always with you. He never leaves you nor forsakes you. Your feelings cannot be trusted. The Bible says he never leaves us nor forsakes us. For those three days, my feelings made me feel like God wasn't there. But you know what? He was. He's always with us. And so we have to acknowledge this. We have to acknowledge Christ in us. You know the word acknowledge. Look at this over in uh, Philemon chapter 1. This is the book right before Hebrews. Titus, Philemon, Hebrews. And Philemon, or Philemon, however you say that. Over in England, they say Philemon, I believe. And in verse 6, it says that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. You have to acknowledge the good things that are in you. And of course, you could talk about healing, anointing, wisdom, peace, all of the fruit of the Spirit, and on and on you can go. But you can sum it all up in saying Christ is in us, the hope of glory. We have to acknowledge this. And this is what makes our faith effective. Again, there's so many people that come to me. And when they come, they present it like, man, I'm desperate. I'm sick. The doctor says I'm dying. And they act as if God isn't in there. If you really got hold of this, that that God Almighty, the Lord Jesus Christ, lives on the inside of you, just inches away from that cancer, is the resurrection power of Jesus. This is not just in symbolism. It isn't just on a piece of paper. But literally, you are God-possessed. Romans chapter 8 verse 9 says, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Anybody who's sitting here saying, Well, I'm a believer, but I don't know that I actually have him physically living on the inside of me, then you aren't his. You have to have the Spirit of Christ. If you've been born again, God Almighty lives on the inside of you. And His resurrection power, His wisdom, His joy, His peace... Everything that he is, everything that he has, you've got it on the inside of you. Why do we live as just mere mortals? Because you know what? We aren't focused on this. We aren't really acknowledging this on a regular basis. When the Lord began to show me what I term spirit, soul, and body, 
And I saw that in my spirit is the part of me that was changed. And my spirit is identical to Jesus, that it is the spirit of Jesus that was given unto me. When I got a revelation of this, I mean everything in my life began to change. Jamie and I had never even heard of Copenhagen, Copeland and Hagen. (laughs) We had never heard faith teaching. We had never heard anybody talk about miracles. We were raised in a Baptist church that we were told that uh, uh, miracles passed away with the apostles and God doesn't do miracles nowadays. I was told it was God that killed my father when I was 12 years old, that it was God who did all of these things. It was completely opposite my doctrine. But I got hold of this revelation of Christ in me, that my spirit was identical to Jesus. 1 Corinthians six seventeen. He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. And 1 John chapter 4, verse 17 says, Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, Jesus, so are we in this world. I got hold of that revelation. I saw Christ living on the inside of me and all of a sudden I no longer approach life as a mere human being. I started looking at cancer and when people told me they had cancer, I did, you know, I'd been told that God doesn't do those kind of things, but I knew Jesus was on the inside of me and I knew that Jesus could handle this and I immediately began to start thinking differently. I remember going to the hospital and praying for a woman that had cancer. And as far as I knew, nobody had been healed of cancer in 2,000 years. But yet I believed for somebody to be healed of cancer just because I knew that God lived on the inside of me. I wish I had better words to convey to you what I'm trying to say. But I'm trying to say to you that if you really acknowledged and believed that Jesus lived on the inside of you, you would not put up with the stuff that you're putting up with. But people, they see themselves as, Lord, I'm only human. I'm just a man. And so you feel powerless when cancer comes. You feel powerless when it's a recession. Everybody's talking about recession. And so you just buckle. And you expect to have financial problems because after all, you're only human. There's no difference between you and the person over next door that doesn't know the Lord. That's not right. You've got Christ living on the inside of you. The same one who when Peter came to him and he says, Lord, do we pay taxes? And he says, sure, we pay taxes. Go down to the water and cast into your hook into the water and the first fish that you catch, look in his mouth and there's money in there. Did you know the same Jesus who did that lives on the inside of you and he can tell you exactly where to go and get money and what you have to do? It says he will supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And yet I'm not trying to scold anybody, but I'm trying to shake you up. And if you'll bend over, I'll give you a good swift kick in the rear and help you get going. But I'm saying that there's many people in this room right now who, when it came to the recession, you approached it as just a person and God's power was out there. And you may have prayed and asked God to do something, but you were passive waiting on him to just dump it in your lap instead of realizing that almighty God lives on the inside of you. And he promised he would supply your need according to his riches and glory, not the U.S. economy. And you just passively sat there waiting on God to do something instead of recognizing God's in you. And if you're going to see God move, you're going to have to move. You're going to have to do something. When you get this concept that God lives on the inside of you, it'll make a difference in the way you approach things. You won't sit there and just put up with it. And when you see a commercial on television where everybody's sick, and if you're over 50, you've got to start having this test and that test, and you're going to have all of these problems. Instead of just swallowing those lies, you'll sit there and say, no, Christ lives on the inside of me. And like these verses that I was using during the offering, you can sit there and say, man, I'm going to meditate in the word day and night. Then I will make my way prosperous. Then I will have good success. It'll be marrow to my bones. I'm going to have long life and peace. And you expect something different because you're God possessed. You know, if you're demon possessed, you expect a person to act a certain way because that demon controls and manifests through them. 
Well, we are God possessed. God himself lives on the inside of us and praise God, you ought to start shooting for something more than just being normal, like people that don't know God. And even Christians are afraid to get their hopes up. Well, I'm afraid to start believing in divine health because what if it doesn't work? What if it does work? Most people are just shooting at nothing every time and hitting it because that's the safe way to live. You'll never be disappointed. You'll never be the same results that Jesus got when he walked on this earth. We ought to be walking in that kind of a life. Again, did you know that religion has come along and taught against the very things I'm saying right here? I can guarantee you there's some people in this room right now sitting there thinking, so you're condemning people. You don't have any compassion. You don't understand. And see that religion has come along and talked about how we just need to sit there. And I'm, I'm not saying that you're mean towards people that don't see the power of God manifest in their life, but we shouldn't lower the standard and say, God doesn't do these things anymore. How dare you try and encourage people to have an abundant life and walk in victory. I have compassion towards people that aren't there. I'm trying to help you and tell you the truth. But I'm saying that, man, God does want you to have an abundant life. There ought to be a difference between you and a person that doesn't know the Lord. You're alive and they're dead. There ought to be a difference between somebody who's born again. And a friend of mine said he had a church service where a person died. They called 911 and they took out half of the congregation before they found the dead person. I mean, most of our church services are dead. You need to look alive. The buzzards are coming, praise God. I'm telling you, if you just got this revelation that Christ lives on the inside of me, I've got God's power. It's not out there someplace. You know, all of this teaching about we've got to clear the heavens and get a path so that our prayers can get up to God. This comes from the lack of understanding that Christ lives on the inside of us. I've heard people pray Isaiah chapter 64. I think it's verse 6 that says, rend the heavens and come down. It's Maybe it's Isaiah 64, 1, but right there someplace close. It says, rend the heavens and come down. And I've heard people pray that. And pray, oh God, rend the heavens. Oh God, send revival. Oh God, stretch forth your hand. Oh God, move. And they feel they have to do something to get God to release his power. That there are demons blocking our prayers from getting up to God. What that does is show the ignorance of people that they don't understand that God rent the heavens. He came down through Jesus and now he lives on the inside of you. You don't need to get your prayers above the ceiling. You don't need to get your prayers above the nose because God lives on the inside of you. That's why you bow your head when you pray so you can look at God. Say, Father, if you had this concept of God Almighty lives on the inside of me, it would change your whole attitude. Now, there's a lot of things you need to know. And like I was announcing on that book, A Better Way to Pray, I've learned some things and now I get better results. I'm not saying that just knowing that God is in you is everything. You've got to learn. Like there's things that talk about death and life are in the power of the tongue. You can release life or death with the words that you say. Faith without works is dead. And on and on. I can share a lot of different things with you. There's things you need to know, but... Just knowing that Christ is in you and having an aware of this and acknowledging it 24 hours a day, every day of your life would change the way you deal with stuff. If you really believe that you were God possessed, if you really believe that God Almighty lived on the inside of you, it would change your whole outlook. It would change everything. It would totally do away with hopelessness. Depression would be impossible. If you really acknowledged his presence with you all of the time, it'd be impossible to be depressed to think that almighty God, who's got billions of people that want his attention, who are praying and asking him for things. He's got a universe to run. He's got so many things to do. And almighty God lives on the inside of you. 
If you really understood that, it would change the way you approach life. And if you don't know these other things that you need to know, but if you just knew this one thing, it would change everything. You know, an old blind squirrel will get a nut every once in a while if it doesn't quit. And if you just knew that, God, you're with me, I don't know how to get you out. I don't know how to release it. I don't know how to receive it, but I know it's here someplace. I guarantee you, you would stumble into victory every once in a while. You just accidentally would get it. This is what Jamie and I did. Did you know when we saw the first blind eye open, I didn't know that anybody's blind eyes had been open in 2,000 years. I'd never heard of it. I didn't know that anybody was praying for it. I thought we were the very first ones. But you know, it happened because I knew Jesus was on the inside and I saw what he did in the Bible, how he healed blind Bartimaeus and how he did other things, put spit on this man's eye and how he started. And I just couldn't help but think that if he's in me, then praise God, the same things he did, I can do also. And we started seeing miracles happening. This is what makes your faith become effectual is by acknowledging every good thing in you. And you can sum all that up by saying Christ is in you and everything he's got, all of his power, all of his wisdom. We sing these stupid songs like, Lord, further along, we'll know all about it. Further along, we'll understand why. And we just glorify our infirmities. And in the natural, with your little peanut brain, I admit that we don't know everything. Some of you can't even find your glasses when they're on top of your head. <laughs> With our brains, we don't know it all. But in our spirit, it says, 1 Corinthians 2, 16, we have the mind of Christ. If you really believe that Jesus lives on the inside of me, I've got his wisdom. He has made unto me wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, 1 Corinthians 1, 30. If you really believe that all of this was in here, I guarantee you we'd quit singing these stupid songs about we don't understand. Oh, God, we don't know. Further along, we're just going to have to wait till we get to heaven. You can draw on the wisdom of God right now. It says in, in James chapter 1, verse 5, If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally and upbraids not. Doesn't punish you or criticize you, and it shall be given you. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. He that wavers is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. If you, if you don't have wisdom up here in your little peanut-sized brain then just ask God for, based on those verses and believe that you've got the mind of Christ. You've got the wisdom of God and God will give it to you. But instead, we've come along saying, well, we just don't understand. I'm an old sinner saved by grace. And we focus on our physical, mental limitations instead of who we are in Christ. We aren't thinking about it. You need to have a superiority attitude, not in yourself not in your carnal self. You need to have a realistic attitude that you know what? You are a mess in yourself. That the flesh is impossible to please God. It is not your natural ability. Don't lean under your own understanding. But then you need to have this other concept that I can do nothing by myself. John chapter 15 verse 5. But I'm never by myself. And through Christ I can do all things. Philippians 4.13. And you've got to have those two things in balance. You and yourself are nobody, but Christ in you is everything. And you can do all things through Christ. Man, that's awesome. You know, I grew up with all kinds of problems, primarily because of religion. And I was an introvert, couldn't look at a person in the face. I just had a lot of things. I was totally inept at and things. And one of them, my brother, when my dad died, my brother came and he, he says, I'm going to be your father and take over. He was four years older than me. I was 12. He was 16. And I told him, you are make a lousy father. And I resented it. And there was this sibling rivalry. And my brother, he could, he's never seen anything mechanical that he couldn't fix. When he was about 17, he took a car apart, the motor, down to the last bolt and nut and put it back together just to see if he could do it. And he did it. He's just a master 
mechanic. And anyway, he tried to force me to become a mechanic. And so I went the other direction just to spite him. You aren't going to make me this. So as a result, I can barely put a nut on a bolt. <laughs> but anyway, when I came, when the Lord changed my life and I started recognizing Christ in me, the hope of glory, did you know it started affecting Thank you.